Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is William Sanderson Mayer. I'm the managing editor of Medical Brief. Welcome to this first in a series of five webinars sponsored by the Professional Providence Society, PPS, with Professor Robin Wood of the University of Cape Town and of the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. In the series, Professor Wood will be looking at the fast moving research and developments around the COVID-19 pandemic. But most of all, we're hoping that we will have sufficient time and that we can explore in greater detail with medical practitioners the problems and experiences that they are having in the front line with one of South Africa's most eminent medical scientists. Professor Woods is director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center. He's a member of UCT's Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine. Uh, a National uh, Research Foundation A-rated scientist, visiting fellow at Harvard Medical School, honorary professor at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He no, no, no. um, numerous uh, scientific advisory boards uh, on PEPFAR, the Un United States President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, the World Health Organization, the International AIDS Society, the International Partnership for Microbiocides and ARAS, the TB Vaccine Initiative, as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Professor, Woods is one, Professor Wood is one of those forthright scientists who rigorously follow the evidence no matter where it takes him and is always completely indifferent to the politicians and the politics around medicine. So it's great to know that you'll be interpreting COVID for us over the next month and um, We'll kick off quickly. I just want to discuss the format. We'll have half an hour of discussion. In the meantime, please post your questions on the Q&A uh, as written questions. We'll collate them and uh, put them to Professor Wood at the end and uh, try and cover as much ground as possible by, by actually uh, putting them together as, as omnibus questions. Uh, Robin, uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you again for being here today. Before we go into what you are ostensibly going to be looking at, the, um, the whole matter of prevention and treatment and research around that, um, all that excite all the excitement that this week has created, that has greeted the Oxford uh, dexamethasone study. Is that, a, is that the problem solved now? Can we all go home or where are we? Where does it stand now? It's a step forward. Um... I don't think it's um, going to be a panacea for everything. It's, it's, um, it's very large numbers. So even though it's not been peer reviewed at the moment, it looks as though the numbers are very significant. I mean, it's a study of about 6,000 um, patients and the event, the effect is, is pretty uh, significant. So essentially um, uh, the death, rate amongst people on ventilators was decreased from 41 percent to 27 percent with these large numbers that's um, very um, statistically significant the difference uh, that's when they gave the uh, dexamethasone at quite a low dose this is six milligrams uh, a day um, when they gave it to patients with a little bit earlier disease those are patients that were oxygen dependent then the decrease went from 25% mortality to 20% mortality, which is a, uh, an effect size of about 20%. Again, because of the large numbers, this reaches statistical significance. But really, in part of the way, the answer, it's not, the, it's not going to solve all our problems, because if you give it to people with an earlier stage of disease um, that don't require oxygen, there was no benefit. They said there was no significant uh, decrease, but in fact there was a slight increase, and again um, uh, we we need to watch that space. But so what it's showing you is that if you don't need oxygen, uh, dexamethasone is not going to be any help for you. If you do need oxygen, it's a little bit of a help, and if you're on a ventilator with a very bad prognosis, it will improve that prognosis. And this drug has been around for a long time. Normally. Um, it's recommended for patients with so-called ARDS, uh, severe respiratory uh, distress, and it's usually used at much higher doses than this. So this, I think the big group for me is that 
oxygen dependent group that we can improve their uh, prognosis and um, uh, stop them going on to ventilators. So I think that's the big group. But obviously the patients on ventilators are a relatively small group of patients with a very poor prognosis, but that prognosis is now a little bit better. But uh, the condition they had used to be treated with um, dexamethasone high dose as part of um, normal therapy. So it'll, it's basically a continuation of a therapy that's already happening. For the ARDS, that's the patients on um, respira respirators. It's been recommended uh, to give um, uh, patients with um, a very poor prognosis with ARDS higher dose, but it's never been given to patients with um, just oxygen, uh, not requiring ventilation. So essentially, this is one of these drugs that um, it damps down the immune system. And um, that's a good thing when you've got a, uh, an over exuberant uh, immune system, but not if you've got a well functioning one. So that's probably why uh, the drug's not going to be of use to patients with much earlier disease. Robin, does this mean that the most promising route forward is going to be research into steroids or um, is it going to change the, the, the path of, of the research that's taking place now? I think that uh, this is a, a sort of typical of uh, medical science that we tend to uh, focus on the sickest of the patients, whereas if you want to make a public health um, impact, uh, then you need to stop patients uh, getting the disease, you need to um, um, uh, stop them progressing to disease, you need to be able to treat early disease, um, uh, but focusing on very, very late disease is is something which um, is done in Western medicine, but doesn't really make a massive impact on the uh, population effect of a public health approach. And so, so the answer yes, is not going to make COVID um, uh, disappear. It's not going to change the numbers a lot. But if you happen to be sick, very sick, uh, you would be very grateful to have access to this drug. And what are the implications for? the research that's been going on into hydroxychloroquine and uh, the related drugs? Uh, so chloroquine, um, as you know, is, as, um, uh, it started off as being a very attractive option because it was cheap. It had been given to many millions of people over, over decades. Um, and it had very good in vitro uh, data for switching off a viral activity in a test tube and therefore there were lots and lots of uh, studies started in China um, and um, the reports were uh, that it was beneficial and then we got a little bit of a French small study which showed that it was beneficial but subsequently we've got um, equivocal results uh, for prognosis uh, for prophylaxis um, the um, uh, veterinary study uh, in the US. Um, then we had a problem with the very high dosage. So uh, the dosage um, that was given in, for instance, the Brazilian study uh, was um, probably four or five times higher than normal, and they reported extra deaths. So there's a, uh, it, although the drug was cheap, uh, it was safe. It was safe in the doses that were used for malaria prophylaxis. The higher doses appear to be uh, cardiotoxic, uh, and a lot of the patients with COVID do have uh, cardiac comorbidity. So therefore, the high dose is really um, problematic. And the Brazilian, I think, was 12 grams given during the course, and that increased mortality. So it doesn't look as though there is a big... Um, effect size uh, uh, as opposed to the, um, um, the dexamethasone study. Um, so some people are still protagonists for it. Um, it is in, in, in the test tube, it's an ionophore for zinc and people are saying, oh well you didn't give it with zinc. Uh, but it doesn't look as though the effect of the size, the effect size is really going to make a big impact on, um, on COVID either for treatment or for prophylaxis. Um, but people are still looking at it. Robin, let's turn then to the prevention part of that equation. And when we spoke for the first time in April, 
you were very emphatic, uh, quite contrary to the advice given by the World Health Organization, that homemade masks and masks for the general public uh, were, were necessary, essential, and people should do it immediately. Uh, you've since been proved correct on that, of course. And you also stressed effective testing. Um, what do the statistics and research indicate South Africa should be doing now, and maybe what we should be doing differently? Um, how do you see the picture for prevention at the moment? Um, I think you can separate that into factors which um, impact on the transmission itself and factors which impact on the individuals um, at risk of getting infection. So certainly my strong view is that we know that this disease can be spread by three different methods, although in the South African guidelines they say it's only two methods. Uh, but essentially we can contaminate the surfaces around us and that's fomites and that's uh, helped by uh, hand clean cleaning. Uh, the second one is large particle um, uh, production which probably is mainly produced during speech as people uh, articulate their vowels and consonants uh, they produce a shower of very large particles and that can be easily stopped by a cloth mask and by um, a reasonable distance. Uh, the third one, which I think people are not looking at, is the small particles that are less than five microns, which remain airborne for prolonged periods of time. This is the same method of dissemination as TB, tuberculosis. And I think that has been um, ignored and has been played down uh, by the WHO and by our own um, advice, um, guidelines and I think that's probably a mistake. I think that um, the way that you control that type of particle is by old-fashioned ventilation. Uh, you can substitute ventilation with um, UV light and uh, protection with um, N95 masks. Uh, the policy in many parts of the world has been unless you're doing something specifically to produce aerosols you can get away with a surgical mask. And I think the evidence from Europe on the very high infection rates amongst doctors show that that's probably wrong. Um, I don't see why um, transmission shouldn't be by small particles. We know that everybody produces small particles when they take deep breaths in uh, and when they shout or do any, any um, loud respiratory, uh, forceful respiratory maneuver. The problem is we don't know which of those three methods of transmission is most important in each and every every uh, scenario. So you can imagine in a crash, you probably think fomites and kids uh, contaminating surfaces would be very, very important. I think probably in hospitals, small particles uh, become more important. Um, so that's the transmission side of things. I think we're missing out on the old fashioned ventilation, which I feel very strongly about. Um, I think the other, um, the other thing that follows from that is that we have to recognize that most of the transmission of respiratory diseases is indoors and not outdoors. So I think that um, the emphasis on staying two meters away from people outdoors, uh, I can't see the rationale for that. Then the next part of your question is, are there people that are more susceptible and less susceptible to getting the disease? So we, we suspect that people who've already had it, that produce antibodies are probably likely to be uh, somewhat uh, protected. Uh, certainly that was the case with MERS and the SARS. Um, but um, what I'd like to lead that into, which I suspect the question is, is what about vitamin D status? Um, there is a problem uh, in temperate zones that uh, people with uh, darker skin color uh, are, are dying and getting this disease much more frequently than other people. And there's a lot of debate about that, but one of the um, one of the causes of that could well be a vitamin D deficiency, because vitamin D is produced uh, during exposure to sunlight, which um, in the northern hemisphere um, at higher uh, latitudes is inadequate. Um, and we know that there's a lot of difference between countries, which has not been explained by our normal. SIR uh, modeling studies. And if we look at the, at the countries which have been particularly severely affected, certainly a lot of that effect could be explained by vitamin D status.
So vitamin D, there's some individual data um, from, um, um, let me see, uh, Philippines. They, um, they picked up that patients with severe disease compared to mild disease had much lower vitamin D. Same thing was found in uh, Indonesia. Patients dying had lower vitamin D levels. And there's been a couple of studies looking at European uh, countries and linking the um, infection rates with the background um, deficiency of vitamin D rates. And uh, it's all circumstantial evidence, but there's an awful lot of it. Uh, so there's a biological plausibility and there is, um, it, it, it certainly looks as though it could explain a lot of the difference between different, uh, different countries and it's cheap. Um, the problem is that the people who would benefit from vitamin D are those that are deficient in it. It won't be a benefit to patients uh, who have adequate stores of vitamin D. So um, being replete for the vitamin is good. Having excess of it is not going to be any better. So whenever you look at the studies, you realize it's that group of uh, individuals that are deficient that are most likely to benefit from vitamin D. And um, in Europe, some countries use fortification of food substances to, to a high degree. Again, Finland is very aggressive on that, and Finland had very low um, uh, case uh, rates and case fatalities compared to other countries. Italy, interesting, northern Italy, uh, elderly females uh, have a, an incredibly high um, deficiency rate of vitamin D. So it could explain some of the uh, strange anomalies uh, uh, between um, nations. Um, and um, it has a rationale at an individual group level and at a country level. Uh, and it's relatively uh, cheap to give to individuals. But the only people who are going to benefit are those that are already deficient in it. Given, given what's uh, the likely, uh, the likely selling the vitamin D around its supplementation around that um, as people pick up on, on the issue in, in, in the media. What, is, what, are, what are the levels of vitamin D deficiency in a country like South Africa? Well, there's not a lot of data, but I think um, um, if you look at the uh, studies that have been done, it's relatively low. Um, so at population level, I think it was, it was in the order of um, 10%. Uh, whereas uh, in Northern Italy, I think for the elderly, uh, it was 80%. And um, in Belgium, which was particularly hard hit, it was about 44% deficient. So we're relatively um, um, better off than most countries. And again, could that explain the different trajectory that we've got compared to it? I suspect it's going to explain some of it, but not all of it. I, I want to digress for a moment. Um, I just noticed that, uh, I, and I hate to I, I hesitate to contradict our president, but I saw in his question and answer the other night that he said that we're not, uh, we're not collecting statistics according to race, which seems to me odd since we collect statistics on, on race in, in, in every other sphere, but especially since there is this differential between African Americans and, 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 and white uh, Americans and also um, British, Asian, and minority ethnic groups in the United Kingdom. Um, the NICD did release some statistics recently, according to race in South Africa, and that showed that 63% of South Africans uh, were black African uh, South Africans. Um, what do you make of that? Well, I think if there's, a, ra if there's a, a sort of scientific rationale for why there would be difference uh, in races, then, then I think it, it, it's appropriate to collect that data. Um, uh, I think that uh, we have a rationale here that um, pigmented, pigmented skin <clears throat> is important, but it's really important in temperate northern zones. It hasn't been really shown to be important here. So, um, um, I think it might be of interest to see if there is a big difference. Um, uh, I'm not sure that uh, in this country that uh, it's going to uh, be that important, but um, I don't know on the data. But certainly it, it seems to be that um, uh, Afri African Americans are at particularly high risk. Doctors in the National Health Service uh, 
uh, have very high rates if they come from uh, Indian subcontinent and from Africa, um, which is of interest because they, um, they wouldn't be uh, of lower social economic status. And that's one of the problems is that um, if, we, if we look at race, uh, it, it's confounded by other issues. So I think uh, I would restrict it if there's a biological plausibility to it, but there is a bit of a plausibility here because of the vitamin D status, but I don't know of any data that says that uh, um, indigenous African population has lower vitamin D than white population here. I just don't know. Uh, if it did, um, what are we going to do about it? My feeling is that um, whoever uh, it is that's deficient in vitamin D um, deserves to have a cheap supplementation available to them. Okay, so that, it might be some sort of scientific interest, but I don't think it's going to be of any practical uh, 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 interest on how we uh, deal with the epidemic. There are so many other social factors that are important. Um, for us, uh, vitamin D is probably going to be relatively small. It explains the difference why we're doing much better than the West, because we have different demography and we're less, uh, we have less vitamin D deficiency, but I'm not sure that it really justifies um, uh, going into a racial uh, um, uh, collection of data. Robin, why don't you uh, lay out where the research is taking us in terms of treatment and what South African practitioners should be thinking about and looking at in the, in, in the near future or immediately in terms of treatment? Well, one of the problems that I have with our response to the epidemic is that I'm unsure what the overall strategy is. Uh, the strategy has changed from um, flattening the curve. Um, it could be to try and decrease mortality, um, but it seems to now be to decrease incident rates. And I think we need to be uh, clear as to which of those is our strategic aim and then to, um, uh, to, aim to try and achieve that. Um, uh, if it's to decrease mortality, then as we said right at the beginning, it's protecting people with comorbidities, it's protecting old people in homes, it's uh, looking out particularly for our uh, healthcare workers. Um, if we get diverted into saying, well, we want to just decrease cases regardless, then the consequences of that is you start closing down schools and things for very little benefit in the way of mortality. So what does that mean for testing? As, uh, as there's been a lot of criticism of the government's approach on, on, on testing. What's your view on that? I think they've done quite a good job. I mean, there's 1.2 million tests have been done. Uh, it's quite interesting that it's been a steady uh, increase in uh, numbers of tests which has been associated with a steady increase in the test yield. So it's gone from about 2% up to almost 8%. Um, I think it gives us some idea of what's happening. I think the mortality data is, um, is much more compelling from my point of view. And uh, if you look at the epidemics around the world, even a global epidemic, the number of cases is going up um, with time, but the numbers of deaths per day are staying stable, uh, which is a quite an interesting phenomenon, um, which, which I think is basically good if your strategy is to limit mortality. It's not good if your strategy is to just limit uh, infections regardless. Um, so I think the testing uh, has been as good as we could do. I think it's an amazing to get up to 1.2 million in uh, a country of uh, 66 million people or 60 million people. Um, I, I think it gives us an idea of where the epidemic is. Um, I think uh, the, the mortality rates are particularly important. And um, if you compare us with other countries, it looks as though we don't have a hidden mortality uh, that we haven't picked up uh, in excess mortality uh, from what over and above what we'd expect. I mean, I was puzzled by um, the Ecuadorian experience where it looked sort of medieval. They were, people were dying in the streets, et cetera. And yet when you looked at the official um, results, the mortality rates were relatively low. But if you look at the excess mortality, it was actually high. So they weren't picking them up. Um, I think the evidence is that um, we are, we've got a reasonable handle on our epidemic. Uh, our problem, well, not a problem, um, our conundrum is 
why is the Western Cape affected when other uh, provinces are relatively light, uh, lightly affected? And I think that shows that there are many things um, in the susceptibility and the force of infection, uh, the RO number, that are different in different places that we don't understand all of them. Thanks, Robin. Um, I'd like to, if you're, if you're amenable to it, and this is something you particularly want to, to, to pick out now, is move on to the questions because there's a flood of them coming in. Um, <laughs> is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to touch on? Um, we haven't uh, touched on other treatments. Um, yeah. um, there is um, remdesivir, um, which um, seems to have some ability to decrease um, hospitalization, but I don't think we've got much experience of it here. Uh, we've got um, tocilizumab, uh, um, which is um, thousands of dollars for a shot, which seems to have some effect on the uh, cytokine storm. But um, these are again the Western focus on the end stage. I, I think that we should be um, looking at the, um, the earlier stages and making sure that uh, individuals that uh, have this diagnosis have reasonable nutrition, um, are screened properly for progression, and those are the things that are going to make a difference. Um, but we do have um, this um, concern that hospital systems can be overwhelmed. And um, I was trying to think about this a little bit. It's quite interesting that we have 300,000 TB cases a year and uh, 63,000 TB deaths a year. And yet that doesn't stress our hospital system the same as um, um, 1,500 uh, COVID um, uh, deaths. So um, it's interesting that I think our healthcare systems are not particularly adept at dealing with um, respiratory transmitted diseases. Um, and that's part of the reason that we're suffering so much from that. Um, that's just an observation. Thanks, Robin. Uh, I have a question here from Olivia Little. In those patients with mild to moderate COVID, being managed at home, would, would, would prednisone be a consideration early on? And will studies only fo focus on dexamethasone and those who are inpatients? So I think, first of all, the rationale for, um, uh, for steroids is to damp down an over-exuberant um, um, immune response. So I don't think there's a, 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 a rationale for giving it very early on in disease. And I think the latest study, which is um, a, a preprint that's come out from the um, National Health Service in the UK and Oxford model, that actually showed, they said non-significant, but there was an increase in mortality when it was given to hospitalized patients that didn't require oxygen. And I think that means that uh, there is no way that we would want to be putting that out like smart is to give to large numbers of people. There's no rationale. And the evidence that we have at the moment is that it's potentially harmful. Uh, Dr. Ingram um, Anderson asks, when should we begin with anticoagulants? Ah, so um, this, is, um, this is a treatment question for um, uh, hospitalized patients. And um, there, there are several components that are monitored. Uh, I have to point out that I'm not looking after patients at the moment, but um, um, what I'm aware of is that you have inflammatory markers uh, such as ferritins and, um, and uh, C-reactive proteins, which go to very, very high levels particularly the ferritins. And that's uh, an indication of an over-exuberant um, immune system. And that's when uh, IL-6 blockers and those sort of things are measured. And the other one is looking at the breakdown products of, um, uh, of uh, clotting, intravascular clotting, and D-dimers are one of, the, uh, one of the things there. So I think um, um, the choices there uh, for uh, in intensivists are most patients are going to pay, go into, um, into hospitalization and going to be immobilized for some length of time, are given um, uh, uh, low-dose um, uh, heparin regimens. But those with uh, raised um, D-dimers, 
um, I think um, usually go on to full anticoagulation. Um, I think that's the US practice. Again, a treatment question. Tabla Mashigo asks about the benefits of remdesivir versus early late versus late uh, intake. Um, I'm only aware of it being used in hospitalized um, uh, patients. It's, I'm not sure it's, it's accessibility um, is, is limited and its final price um, I see is somewhere between $10 and uh, I think $20,000 depending on how effective they think. At the moment it seems as though um, there's evidence in the States it decreases hospitalization from I think 11 days to 7 days which has major economic benefits for the um, American health system and therefore that's, that will determine its final um, price. But it's still, um, um, the data is suggesting that it, uh, it does have some effect on speed of recovery, but not, uh, I don't think it's been shown to have a mortality benefit to date. Robin Duarte, any comments from Professor Wood regarding findings that individuals with blood type A are at increased risk? It's an, well, I find it reassuring because I am blood group O, um, and um, that's the low risk, and the A is the high risk. Um, it's, um, I don't know what the um, significance of that's going to be because no one can change their blood group. It may explain some of the variability, as I, as I pointed out before, there's a lot of things that we don't understand. Uh, vitamin D, we thought, might explain some of it. Blood groups may explain some of it. Um, uh, but um, vitamin D we can do something about, blood groups you can't really do much about. So it's an interesting and real uh, observation, but I don't know that it's of great significance. Liesl Rosenberg, what about the racial differences in ACE receptors and activity? Could that explain the differences in infections? I think that probably that's more likely and then I'm, I'm, I'm hypothesizing here, more likely to explain the difference and the relationship to comorbidities. I mean, this disease is very, very strongly um, associated with um, diabetics, diabe diabetes and uh, uh, blood sugar control and also hypertension. And I think those are conditions which are much more likely to have um, impacts on uh, vascular uh, ACH2 receptors. Um, Racial differences may well be there, but I don't think they're going to be anything as um, as important as the um, uh, the comorbidities. If you look at uh, overall mortality, and uh, you know I've got a 19-year-old uh, son, so I calculate that his uh, uh, mortality risk at the moment in South Africa is is one in two million. And if I go to um, the elderly above the age of 70. Uh, which might strike home for me, uh, then I have about um, uh, a 200-fold higher risk of uh, succumbing to this disease. That's the thing that drives it. It's not going to be racially driven. It's, it's, it's determined by uh, comorbidities and age. Um, uh, the data at the moment, that's by far and away. Whether or not um, there is an independent... Um, uh, small racial effect because of ACE2 um, inhibit, uh, receptors, I don't know, but I doubt if it's going to be uh, of any great significance compared to the other massive difference uh, as your age goes. This is unlike flu. I mean, it's, flu is a U-shaped curve. This is just an, um, a, an exponential curve with age and with uh, comorbidities. Um, and um, uh, the risks to the elderly and those with co comorbidities uh, are hundredfold higher than young people. So I think that means that that's going to, that's going to quench any racial difference that you're going to pick up. So genetic susceptibility is not a big issue at all? I wouldn't say that. You, you, you're saying, I don't, th I think, you know, race, has a large socioeconomic factor to it. Yes. And very, its its other factors are relatively minor. We've come across one in pigmentation may be more linked to vitamin D and therefore it may be slightly more. 
but um, uh, your question was slightly different worded. You said that uh, immunity... Um, um, yes, sorry, I'm segueing into a different area. Yeah. Uh, I, I suspect that there are individuals whose innate immune system makes them less vulnerable to respiratory diseases. I suspect that there are some people who have met diseases which cross-react with this. Um, there was a science article which showed that blood taken several years ago contained T cells which responded um, and controlled COVID-19 um, um, uh, virus, uh, even though it wasn't targeted at the spike protein, it was some of the other proteins. So what it says is the innate immunity will be different, uh, your educated immune responsive will be different, your vitamin D status will be different. So there is a lot of heterogeneity within the human population, most of it not explained by race. Uh, Dr. Anderson asks again about uh, the chloroquine, saying they have side effects in the longer term which affect the retina. As a rheumatologist, the retinopathy may sometimes occur fairly early on. One is alarmed that many patients have been committed to prolonged prophylactic treatment. Your opinion? So again, I think this, this is real. It's to do with dose. Um, many years ago I was, um, I ran a small clinic in Central Africa and used chloroquine for my own family, etc. Um, and at the doses that we were giving, it was relatively safe and I didn't, although I looked for retinopathy, I didn't find any. I noticed that the questioner is a rheumatologist. Rheumatologists use much larger doses of chloroquine and I think uh, they need to be um, uh, appropriately aware of the side effects. So again, um, I'm not trying to give chloroquine a clean bill of health, but at the dosages that were used for um, um, chloroquine, for malaria prophylaxis, it was very well tolerated over many decades. Um, we know that uh, in the Brazilian study, in a short period of time, with a 12 gram dose, they had cardiac uh, problems. And I would agree um, that uh, prolonged use um, would be uh, would pre predisposed to um, retinopathy, which you, know, you can pick up with colour charts, etc. But um, it's a potential problem. But I've I have treated hundreds of patients with chloroquine in my earlier years and never saw a retinopathy from that. But that's a totally different um, a condition than giving very high doses, where we're seeing um, a cardiac and potentially you might see. Um, uh, visual field problems. Roman, there's a lot of interest in transmission by asymptomatic patients. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, I think it probably is very significant. As I mentioned earlier, um, I, I, I think that the transmission modes of transmission are going to be of variable importance in variable settings. But I think there is um, uh, quite a lot of evidence that uh, asymptomatics may transmit and the question is what is the population attributable risk of this and that's the key so if somebody is a transmitter and is unaware of it and they happen to be doing it for a long period of time then they will contribute uh, to the population attributable risk much higher attempts to measure that um, I'm aware of a couple of studies um, one of which was around about 15 percent and the other was of the order of 60 percent um, uh, claiming that um, asymptomatic carriage, carriage uh, was um, responsible for that. I think uh, in a conversation with you, you came up with a, a recent article which was around about 45% was it or 60%? Yes, anyway, 45%. Mm. It's, it's an unpopular sort of thing to say because uh, you can't target it and I think that's maybe why the WHO wanted to focus more on uh, cleaning hands, et cetera. But I think it is significant. I think that we have a problem that if you look in Europe, um, the number of medical individuals that got infected, it's particularly high in Spain. Um, I, I was just talking to someone in uh, uh, London hospital and 25% of their population um, tested positive with antibodies. So I think it's, it's real. It's absolute magnitude, we don't know but it occurs and how much it contributes to the overall uh, transmission is unknown, but I suspect that it will vary tremendously on the environment that you're in. 
There's an interesting question here. Uh, considering that the first outbreak was in the wet food market in China, and the new outbreak, there's now a new outbreak in the meat market, um, as well as the news that 650 people tested positive in a meat processing factory, is there a meat transmission link here? In other words, are vegetarians safer? <laughs> um, yes, in the US, um, the meat processing uh, plants um, were related to, exp um, uh, to very high um, incidence rates uh, of COVID. Uh, it was attributed to the um, environment they were working in and transmission from human to human. I don't think anybody invoked from the frozen carcasses to the humans. On the other hand, um, early on, COVID, there, there are many COVID uh, viruses which affect animals and the, uh, or the origin of the infection probably came from a trans uh, species jump. And that obviously would be associated with, um, uh, with um, uh, meat and uh, meat products. Uh, not dissimilar to Ebola with um, uh, bushmeat practices, etc. But the transmission at the moment is um, from human to human. And I don't think there's any evidence in the recent outbreak in uh, Beijing that this is a new strain. Um, that that could be checked to see whether or not this is another species jump. But at the moment, the feeling is that this is just human to human transmission that has been reintroduced into a susceptible population. Two treatment questions um, or management questions, aspirin and convalescent plasma. Um, I'm not aware of any real rationale, rationale for why aspirin should be um, 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 of use in this disease. Certainly conditions like Kawasaki's, I think, um, which has hit the news in the U UK, is predisposed to by, um, by those drugs. Convalescent um, um, serum is particularly uh, interesting and has a rationale behind it because it, it, it was used in the original SARS and uh, MERS epidemics and was shown to be um, uh, beneficial. Um, it has uh, problems for uh, wide, widespread use. You have to find the appropriate uh, donor. You have to do uh, screening and uh, a little bit like uh, blood matching. And uh, one donor can normally produce enough uh, treatment for two patients. So the availability of it is very limited. I think that um, uh, there's something like 6,000 units have been given to 5,000 patients in the US. And I haven't seen any uh, rigorous analysis of those results. But certainly it has a good rationale. Uh, it's been useful in other diseases from Ebola to um, other coronaviruses, um, and it is being used, but it's, it's, um, it has a lot of practical limitations. Christine Skitter also uh, looking at that area. Christine Skitter asks, is there any evidence of glutathione intravenous therapy being beneficial in the early stages for hospitalized patients? And then what about NSAIDs in the treatment? So, um, superoxide um, damage has always been um, recognized as being part of the pathogenesis and people have, um, um, uh, have proposed that um, N-acetyl, uh, cysteine and other drugs that um, uh, can um, um, impact on superoxides may be useful. This story has been around for decades and yet uh, I'm unaware of any disease that's actually been shown to have a clinical benefit from it. So again, it has a, uh, a good scientific rationale, but I'm unaware of any data that actually uh, justifies. On the other hand, these drugs are relatively benign and not noxious. And um, it's a, I sort of think about it in the same way as the vitamin C story that, uh, you know, people are protagonists for these things. There is some rationale, rationale behind it, but uh, really hasn't ever um, come out with hard data. 
but um, the modalities are relatively benign and therefore wouldn't feel too strongly about not doing, but there's no evidence really that it's going to make better. And I'm, um, uh, the, the NSAIDs, um, there was an interesting article early on that they were harmful. Um, now I think there's you know, it's probably, it's probably relevant um, uh, to the pathogenesis. You have touched on it, but would you like to expand on this thing of pe people who are, are asymptomatic but test positive? Is this because the test is not so good or, or, or is it something else that's causing that? Um, so tests, the tests are pretty good. Um, I think the, uh, the RNA assay is, is very good. Um, there's obviously problems with uh, sample collection. So if you don't um, uh, collect an adequate sample, uh, it's not going to be as sensitive. There's also the site of the infection. So it seems as though um, uh, you get increasing <clears throat> sensitivity of the assay as you move from the upper respiratory to the lower respiratory. So uh, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage has a much higher uh, positivity rate than a um, than a throat swab and a nasal swab has better sensitivity than, um, than a throat swab and a sputum has. So it's graded, uh, but um, the sensitivity is, is, is pretty reasonable. I think if you look, I think um, in the Iceland, um, uh, which is a small country with a lot of um, uh, testing, I think they, uh, they claim that 40% of people weren't aware of symptoms. So you, you have the next problem is that, um, you could be symptomatic but not think it was particularly unusual so defining asymptomatic is a little bit tricky but there's no doubt that it does occur and i think the majority of the cases will be because of the variability of the immune response to the virus rather than uh, an inadequate um, testing but there's no doubt that some people have been have tested negative um, but that's you know that's the sensitivity of the test and the sensitivity is certainly um, looks like it's um, uh, from a nasal swab is above 60%, but it's not 100%. So um, there will be the odd um, ones that you have to repeat um, or uh, get a better specimen. But the same, you've got to remember in TB, we find a sputum positive diagnosis in about 50% of cases. So oh. in this disease, we're doing much, much better than that. Again, with testing, Nelson Ikaba asks, is there any hope for us for use of antibody tests for diagnosis in the near future? I think it's um, probably not going to be as useful for diagnosis, but I think it's going to be very useful for really understanding what has taken place. Uh, as you said, if, if, if there's a significant number of people who have been asymptomatic and not aware that they've had the disease, knowing um, that a large proportion of the population is relatively immune to a new infection uh, from an epidemiological point of view is really important. Um, uh, just to sort of go anecdotally, um, a student of mine that's in the uh, UK just recently tested positive on the serology but negative on the, um, on the nasal swab. He's, he's a, a medical um, practitioner and um, that's actually quite reassuring to know that uh, for him. Uh, he's going back to his family and meeting his grandparents and everything else, knowing that he's had the disease. So I think that um, the antibody tests um, will be very useful. I think they probably could be at the moment, but they, uh, they haven't been allowed in. Um, I think SAPRA has not um, registered any as of yet. So we're awaiting them. Uh, but I think it's going to be a very useful adjunct. Um, its actual ability to diagnose acute disease, I don't think uh, there's any evidence from anywhere else that it has uh, proven useful for that. It's usually shown that someone has had it asymptomatically or recovered from asymptomatic um, uh, infection. And obviously you can't really give um, hyperimmune convalescent serum unless you could measure it. And this is one of the ways of measuring it. First word, we've had a number of questions on reinfection. Uh, Bongila Mabilani says, I have a few cases, especially among nurses and doctors. How can I explain this? Might it be the tests? What well, is the yes. evidence? Yes, it might be the, um, um, the tests. 
um, it's, people have been aware that um, um, some individuals take a long time to clear the virus, and therefore when you're using a test that measures uh, uh, virions or the RNA in virions, um, that causes a problem. Whether people have truly recovered and then been reinfected, as far as I'm aware, I'm, I don't think there's any hard evidence uh, for that. Um, generally, uh, most diseases like this, um, where antibodies are produced, um, there is some immunity linked to that. Um, the level of immune globulins that are produced uh, by individuals vary tremendously. I'm aware that some people with relatively mild disease may get less in the way of antibodies and uh, ones with severe may get more. But um, I think generally the feeling is that um, uh, individuals aren't getting infected more than once. But it could be that the data, um, more data will come out later to suggest that that is the case. Um, because of the variability of immune response, wouldn't be totally mind-blowing if that was the case. But at the moment, uh, I think the general feeling is that it's not, um, that it's, it's a once-off disease. Maybe a long time to recover, but uh, there's very few proven recoveries um, with subsequent uh, infections, uh, but uh, the sensitivity of the test would also um, potentially cause a few cases like that. With the hot spots in the Western Cape seemingly being highly concentrated in the Cape Flats areas, is there perhaps a link there to TB in those areas? Uh, in previous years, TB was highly prevalent in Elsie's River, for example, and that's a hot, hot spot as well. Is there, or could there be an increased susceptibility there? So there could be. Uh, on the other hand, uh, remember that um, we said that uh, one of the modes of transmission could be identical to TB. So if you've got a lot of people transmitting uh, in conditions where uh, TB could be easily transmitted, then why wouldn't this disease be transmitted? Um, the association with TB um, has been shown I think um, um, a, a slightly increased uh, risk uh, amongst people who got active TB. Um, I think the interactions with TB are, are of interest. I think TB is a disease that affects uh, poor populations. It's a disease which um, it gets pro pro uh, propagated uh, in crowded, poorly ventilated areas, and so does COVID. And then we had the added problem in that the symptoms with which people present uh, would look very similar. Um, so it's something which I think um, hopefully South Africa will be able to dissect out a little bit. Um, um, but certainly um, there will be associations because of many factors. Uh, David van der Merwe asks, what's the significance of previous BGZ BGC immunization, and is there any place for re-immunization? Well, that is uh, a subject of study. Um, the, um, uh, I think there's um, a large study that's been set up to, uh, to look, look at that. Uh, there are a few little ethical issues there in that there is a worldwide shortage of BCG at the moment, so we don't want to take it away from children, which we know uh, would benefit from it in order to um, pursue a, um, uh, a scientific hypothesis, which may not be of, uh, of uh, great significance. Um, I'm personally a little bit skeptical about it because um, virtually everybody in our poor communities is already infected with TB. Why giving them um, some antigens that are slightly less than a TB infection uh, in, a, in a BCG uh, bacteria? seems um, a little bit stretching it. On the other hand, we know that it has um, uh, in pretty impressive impacts on immunity uh, against certain tumors in the bladder, etc. So I think the hypothesis is there. I think it needs to be um, studied with a suitably powered um, um, trial and um, keep an open mind and it would be interesting if it came up as being positive, but at the moment, it's uh, there's enough data to make it an interesting hypothesis, which should be investigated. 
You spoke of comorbidities such as hypertension and uh, diabetes, but have there been any other studies on other conditions like hyperthyroidism? Hmm. I am not aware of any. Um, the, um, I, I think the strength of um, vitamin D is, is quite strong. Um, I think the, the ability to show a link between hypothyroidism and uh, COVID would be very difficult to design the study, but um, as the numbers increase, then the analyses and the power of analyses to show smaller associations will develop, uh, but I'm not aware of any at the moment. It's a, it's the subject of uh, one of your later webinars, but I wonder if you, there's, a, again, a lot of interest in herd immunity. Um, do you want to just bring us up to date on where the research sits on that? I, I think um, people get very upset by the term. Um, population immunity, I think, is the, uh, uh, the better, better term. Um, there's no doubt that um, all the respiratory, respiratory um, illnesses that have plagued us historically uh, have eventually been sorted out by um, lack of susceptibles. And that's really why we're talking about um, um, whether or not people get reinfected. If they did, then it would mean that um, population immunity would not develop as well as it uh, would do if there's a, a um, strong uh, immune response that uh, lasts for a, a period of time. Um, I, so, yeah, so I was looking at some data, to, trying to imagine how would we know what happens if we had done nothing? And interestingly, in Ohio, there is a prison called Marion, uh, where it looks as though they did nothing. There was no hand washing, the beds are within three feet of each other, uh, there was no social distancing at all, and if you look at uh, Marion, there were 2,500 uh, individuals, prisoners there. 80% of them became infected and they had 88 deaths amongst those. So they had a 3% death rate. Um, but um, it's now um, been labeled as burnt out. And the reason it would be burnt out is because they've run out of susceptibles because 80% um, of the individuals have had it. So there's no doubt that in a closed setting such as that, that uh, population immunity uh, did affect the, um, the epidemic. There, it's, it's come to a close. Um, extrapolating that to uh, um, uh, other populations, uh, is a little bit tricky because as we talked earlier we don't know that everybody is equally as um, susceptible to it but certainly the disease will um, not prosper when it runs out of appropriate um, um, susceptible individuals uh, for whatever reason they become less susceptible that's going to have a big impact on the epidemic curves thanks robin uh we just about out of time, so I won't take any further questions. I'd just like to thank you again so much for, for giving us such a generous amount of your time and your expertise. Uh, the series, it is a, a five-part series, and uh, we invite you to register for, for, further, for further webinars. You'll find details on Medical Brief, and um, if you've attended this one you'll certainly be on our invitation list thanks very much robin thank you william